In this next case, Catherine Alexander tattooed Randy Orton, a WWE wrestler, and then 2K Games made a video game that involved Randy Orton and his tattoo. So who owns what and who owes who money? Let's see what the court had to say. Except it's not a judge's decision, it is a jury verdict. As to the five tattoos in question, do you find defendants? Take Two Interactive, 2K Games, World Wrestling Entertainment, and Visual Concepts Entertainment. Do you find defendants have proven their use constituted fair use? No. As to the five tattoos, what is the dollar amount of actual loss that you find plaintiff is entitled to recover? $3,750. And as to the five tattoos, what is the dollar amounts attributable to defendant's profits? And that was zero. So the fun part about a jury verdict is it does not tell us why the jury made the decision that they made. We get to read into that using the plaintiff's and defendant's filings that went to the jury. First, let's start by looking at the jury instructions. This is what the parties through the court told the jury were the instructions on how to evaluate the case. How do you evaluate a fair use? How do you decide who's right, who's wrong, and who owes who what? Members of the jury, you have seen and heard all the evidence. Now I will instruct you on the law, and then you will hear the arguments of the attorneys. You have two duties as a jury. Your first duty is to decide the facts from the evidence in the case. This is your job and yours alone. Your second duty is to apply the law that I give you to the facts. You must follow these instructions even if you disagree with them. Each of the instructions is important and you must follow all of them. Perform these duties fairly and impartially. Do not allow sympathy to influence you. Nothing I say now and nothing I said or did during the trial is meant to indicate any opinion on my part about what the facts are or about what your verdict should be. In this case, the defendants are corporations. All parties are equal before the law. A corporation is entitled to the same fair consideration that you would give any individual person. The evidence consists of the testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits admitted in evidence, and stipulations or agreements. Certain things are not considered as evidence. If I told you to disregard any testimony or exhibits struck from the record, those are not evidence and must not be considered. Second, anything you have seen or heard outside the courtroom must be entirely disregarded. Third, questions or objections or comments by the lawyers are not evidence. Fourth, the opening statements and closing arguments are not evidence. Demonstrative exhibits are not evidence. Any notes are not evidence. You should consider all of the evidence. Use your common sense. We often look at one fact and conclude that another exists. We call this an inference. A jury is allowed to make reasonable inferences. Any inference you make must be reasonable and must be based on the evidence. You must decide whether the testimony of each witness is truthful and accurate. In evaluating the credibility of witnesses, you must consider the ability and opportunity the witness had to see, hear, or know the things they testified about, their memory, interest, bias, prejudice, intelligence, the manner of the witness testifying. The parties have stipulated or agreed to the following facts. WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment, is an entertainment company that creates and promotes entertainment related to professional wrestling. Randy Orton has been a professional wrestler for the WWE. Catherine Alexander has been a tattooist. Ms. Alexander inked five tattoos on Mr. Orton. Plaintiff and Mr. Orton did not discuss whether he had her permission to allow others to use the tattoos that Ms. Alexander inked on him in a video game. Meanwhile, Take-Two Interactive, 2K Games, 2K Sports, and Visual Concepts develop video games. They made WWE 2K16, 17, 18, and in 2018, Ms. Alexander filed this copyright lawsuit. Plaintiff claims that defendants have infringed plaintiff's copyright in the five tattoos by copying them into their video games. This, and if we take just a slightly longer look at these... You can see live action pictures of Mr. Orton's tattoos, and then it appears that those tattoos have been replicated in the WWE 2K games. I don't think there's a dispute that they were replicated or copied. I think that was established already. Yeah, here is a partial summary judgment order correcting a previous order. 
which I know sounds complicated, but it does very clearly say, as a matter of law, Alexander owns a valid copyright to the five tattoos in this lawsuit, and that the defendants copied Alexander's tattoos, that they are liable for copyright infringement unless they can prove a fair use or other affirmative defense. So we're really only arguing about whether fair use applies. The jury instructions confirm the court has previously ruled that the five tattoos are the subject of valid copyrights, the plaintiff owns the copyrights, and the defendants copied the plaintiff's copyrighted works. So then here are the jury instructions on fair use. This is what you as a juror would be given to determine whether something was a fair use. All of the discussion of fair use on this channel, hours and hours and hours, is dumbed down to this in front of a juror. Defendants contend that their copying is allowed under what the law calls fair use. To succeed on this affirmative defense, defendants must prove that they made fair use of the plaintiff's works, including for purposes such as criticism, parody, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. In deciding this, you should consider the following. The purpose and character of defendant's use, including whether the defendant's use is of a commercial nature or is for a non-profit educational purpose which I think is a disingenuous way to represent the first fair use factor. Yes, that's how it's listed in section 107, but the commercial and nonprofit section isn't given a whole lot of weight compared to the purpose and character section. So that's not captured there. The nature of the copyrighted work, which is also kind of disingenuous, doesn't tell you how to weigh that factor against the other, other three. The amount and substantiality of the portion used is the third factor, and the effect of the use upon the potential market of the copyrighted work is the fourth factor. Those are all very important, and, and there's details as to how those should be evaluated. It is up to you to decide how much weight to give to each factor. Oh, that's... That's not usually how courts do it. If you find the defendants have proved this affirmative defense by a preponderance of the evidence, who is more convincing? then you must find four defendants, and you will not consider the question of damages. If you find that defendants have not proven their defense, then you must find for plaintiff, and you must consider damages. Plaintiff must prove damages by a preponderance of the evidence. Plaintiff may recover for any actual losses she suffered because of the infringement, plus any profits that defendants made from the infringement. So this is an actual damages case, not a statutory damages case. Statutory damages may have been much higher for 2K games using a tattoo artist tattoo in a worldwide AAA game. But because she didn't register her copyrights on time, I'm guessing, this is an actual damages case, and she'll only get what the reasonable licensing fee would have been for her tattoo in the game, which... Randy Orton's tattoo in a WWE game is not the reason why people are buying the game. If I'm into WWE, I'm not going, oh, they recreated Randy Orton's tattoo. I got to go get that game so I can see his tattoo, which I can't see any other way. It makes no sense. So they would have been giving people licensing fees, but probably not giving them like points or percentages of the gross profits or something. You know what I mean? Maybe Randy Orton gets, you know, a half a point of gross or something like that, but not Catherine Alexander. So that's why you'll see the actual damages number isn't that high. So actual losses from copyright infringement include a decrease in market value, profits that plaintiff would have made, what a willing buyer reasonably would have paid plaintiff to obtain a license. And I think that's the key phrase here. In addition to actual damages, plaintiff is entitled to recover profits that she can prove. Defendant's profits are recoverable only to the extent that you have not taken them into account in determining plaintiff's actual losses. Defendant's profits are revenues that defendants made because of the infringement, minus defendant's expenses in producing the video game. So the zero profits damages number is probably because the jury thought that consumers are not buying the game to see Randy Orton's tattoo. But the profits are not directly attributable to Randy Orton's tattoo. Instead, the loss to Catherine Alexander is the loss of a licensing fee. So there's not a whole lot more to that case. What we can look at is plaintiff's trial brief, 
and defendant's trial brief. And rather than taking an hour of looking at those two things, I'm going to try and summarize them briefly. Nah, brief. On the fair use defense, the plaintiffs object that the burden of proof is on defendants and that they anticipate to present evidence at trial simply demonstrating that defendants' copying did not constitute fair use. Okay, so that's unfulfilling. How would I evaluate this? Looking at Randy Orton here, if I'm the medium, my tattoo artist is the author or creator. Under copyright law, anything an author fixes in a tangible medium of expression is automatically the property of the author unless there was a written agreement as to who owns the copyright or that author was the employee of a larger organization and they're making that copyrighted work for the employer, then you don't have to have a written work for hire agreement. I'm assuming that Catherine Alexander is not the employee of Randy Orton, but rather a contractor hired for her services as a tattooist. Big assumption, little assumption, I think that's pretty clear here. She's the author. She fixed the tattoo in a tangible medium of expression. Randy Orton's skin, which is a tangible medium things can be fixed into. The ink is is there and it is expressive. I can look at Randy Orton's skin and perceive the communicated expressive work. I can see the tattoo. I can perceive it, etc. So It's a little weird. We think of the expressive medium as a piece of paper or a canvas or a video recording or something. We don't think of it as someone's body, but he is now the tangible medium of expression. But he does not own the copyrighted work. He is not the author, and they did not have a written agreement as to who owns it. But yeah, sure, there's got to be some kind of implied license that he can walk around in public and other people can look at it, which is a display of a copyrighted work in violation of Section 106, the copyrights, the right to control the display of the work. But this isn't that case. She is not suing him for displaying it publicly on his body walking around. She is suing the video game company that used his likeness without obtaining a license from her for the tattoo. 2K Games could have put any other design in place of her tattoo on his digital character. They could have put a generic skulls pattern instead of her skulls tattoo. And they didn't do that. They put an exact duplicate. So where... Catherine Alexander may have had less of a case against Randy Orton for walking around in public. She definitely has a case against some commercial entity using his likeness and her tattoo exactly, or a recreation of it, in their commercial production. And do you get the difference? That's the important part. The plaintiff also addresses de minimis use, which is that the Use of the tattoo was so small that it's really not a violation. And that's a good argument on the defendant's part, because it is just a tattoo on one character in a much larger video game. And the video game is about the professional wrestling aspect of it and not about viewing tattoos on people's body. Like, you don't buy the game because you want to see Randy Orton's tattoo. I'm going to keep going back to that, I think. The plaintiff addresses the implied license argument as well. They say it is undisputed that Mr. Orton did not receive a written or oral express license to make copies of the works for use in video games. Defendants argue that there was an implied license from plaintiff to Orton, where Mr. Orton in turn was impliedly authorized to sublicense rights to anyone. You know, it's on his body. But that's not How that works. To establish an implied license, defendants must prove that a person requests the creation of the work, that the creator makes that particular work and delivers it to the person who requested it, and that the licensor intends that the licensee copy and distribute the work. 
So yeah, an implied license probably works for the display of the tattoo publicly while he's walking around or while he's even performing on stage uh, in the ring. Um, but probably not when someone puts that into a video game. That's a recreation. It might not even be the same when he wears it for the camera and he's in the ring for the live action performances. That's maybe a gray question that's not answered here. Disgorgement of profits. The plaintiff tries to argue that you always get the disgorgement of profits, and they're not wrong. The problem is what part of the video game is attributable? What, are the, what part of the profits are attributable to the infringed tattoo? And again, I don't think any. No one is buying the game to see the tattoo, and you would never give the tattooist in this situation some cut of the profits. Then the plaintiff on actual damages, the test for valuing an infringing use amounts to a determination of what a willing buyer would have been reasonably required to pay a willing seller. And to me, that's the 3750. I don't know where they presented that. I'm assuming they presented that during the trial. Estoppel is an interesting argument that the defendants relied on plaintiff's promises or representations. Of course, the defendants are the video game companies, not Randy Orton. Let's see what defendants' trial brief had to say. They argue that the evidence at trial will show that at least one of the tattoos plaintiff inked on Mr. Orton's body were copied from his pre-existing back tattoos, therefore plaintiff does not own a valid copyright. A derivative work must be substantially different. I guess that failed. That argument failed. Uh, de minimis use, they're of course going to argue in favor of fair use, de minimis use, and license. For some reason, they put them all together in the same paragraph here. They cite to the Google fair use decision. I'm not sure what that has to do with tattoos. Fair use is a mixed question of fact and law, and reviewing courts should appropriately defer to the jury's findings of underlying facts, but fair use is also a legal question for judges to decide. So that's that's true, actually. On appeal, the whatever circuit, I don't know where we are here, would decide the fair use question de novo or brand new. So the appeals court will conduct this whole fair use analysis over again, assuming that they want to appeal. They might not want to appeal a $3,750 order, but maybe they will. We'll see. They don't go into more detail. So let's go back up. So their fair use brief is not in here. Uh, I really don't see a fair use brief in their brief. Of particular note, the jury instructions on fair use provided the jury with a detailed description of each fair use factor. All right, so yes, I did say that the fair use factors in these jury instructions seemed threadbare and inadequate, but that seems to be their really only, yeah, arguments about fair use. So they, they didn't prove fair use to the jury. I don't think it's a fair use. It's not a transformation. It uses the entire copyrighted work. Remember, we're not talking about how much of it was used in the secondary work. We're talking about how much of the plaintiff's work was used, and it was the entire work. And it steps on the market for licensing the work, so it's not a fair use. But they are right. The defendants are right that this is a mixed question of law and fact, and it will be decided brand new on appeal. But is it really going to be worth appealing? It's a fairly simple case when you get down to it. Putting a tattoo on someone's body is maybe an implied license that they can walk around and show it off, but it's probably not a license to go then sell your likeness, which includes that work. If you're selling your likeness without that work, fine. But if you're selling your likeness and then you're also licensing your likeness with that work in detail, you probably need a license like a real one, like a express paid for license, <laughs> which in this case was $3,750. That sounds fair to me. Does this case set a precedent? No. It's a district court case. District court cases generally don't set precedents in any way until they are affirmed by an appeals court. 
and then the appeals court will decide whether they mark it for precedential use or not. It is persuasive, and if you take legal courses and stuff, they'll talk about uh, persuasive authority versus precedential authority. So while not precedential, I could take this case into Pennsylvania and cite it, and I would have a good basis in the law for filing a lawsuit. Unless the Third Circuit Pennsylvania Court of Appeals, the Federal Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, which covers Pennsylvania, unless they had previously ruled otherwise, and then I would have a fight. And then we'd come in and say, no, you should pay a license fee. They say, no, you shouldn't. And then maybe we have to go up to the Supreme Court on that one. So that could happen, but I doubt it. This is a simple enough case. If I was take two, I would just pay the license fee. But you're right, maybe they're afraid of a slippery slope, the snowball rolling down the hill. If Randy Orton's tattoo wasn't licensed, who else's wasn't licensed, and how many of those plaintiffs are going to come after them for their license fees? These are relatively small license fees, but I've also noticed some of these video game companies, they just don't like even minor inconveniences. Either way, interesting case, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching! Special thanks to my top supporters in October, Eevee, Spirit Bear, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Good Broge, Pure Magma, Eric Tams, Tech Tech Potato, The Blood Soaked Survivors, King Ares, and Kyle Seifring. You can support more Lawful Masses productions on Patreon.com slash LJFrench, Sponsus.com slash Law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for my weekly live production stream on twitch.tv slash lawful masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye.